to be back with you this evening, another Wednesday evening. To God be the glory. God has been very good to us. And we have quite a bit to give him thanks for. He has been protecting us from all dangers. And we give him all the glory and the praise. We magnify his royal name. We sincerely ask him to be with us. Let us go to him in prayer as we invite him to another Wednesday evening Bible class. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your servants approach your throne. We sincerely ask that it will be pleasing to you to grace us with your holy presence this evening and let everything that is going to be said and done be done according to your divine glory. Breathe on your servant, breath of God, and let him speak as never he has spoken. Let the Holy Spirit use him as instrument this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening again, everyone. It's good to be back with you another Wednesday evening. And I tell you something, time has sped up so fast. Before we know it, another Wednesday evening is here. As we look into the word of God together. Well, my production team is here. My prayer team is here. And I am ready to go into the word with you. This evening is going to be another exciting evening to everyone. As our parent text is very, very interesting indeed. One that we have been dealing with for quite some time. As I told you last week that we are dealing with salvation. As a matter of fact, for several weeks now, we have been dealing with salvation. And that word takes in grace and compassion and forgiveness and the love of God. Oh. And the more we delve into the mysteries of godliness is the more we find substance to deal with. And so class, may we gaze back just a little to the verse, verses 17 and 19. May we gaze back just a little to the verses 17 and uh, 17 to 19 of our parent text of Ephesians chapter 1. I repeat, let us gaze back a little bit, just a little bit to verses 17 to 19 of our parent text of Ephesians chapter 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, and the spirit of knowledge. Well, isn't this very awesome? May he be pleased to answer our prayers if we make this prayer to him. Uh, I repeat verses 17 to 19 of our parent text this evening, Ephesians chapter 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. Look at verse 18. May the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the spirit is. And the verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to you or to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? And you don't mind, look at the verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Well, class, what a mighty text this is this evening. Has always been anyhow. The word of God is always be very powerful to us. Class, you will notice that 
the powers of the spirit, the powers of the spirit in general are heightened and extended. A spirit of wisdom, a spirit of wisdom. This is a truth that is not discernible by ordinary human beings. This is a truth, the spirit of wisdom of God's word is not ordinary grasp or grasp by ordinary human beings. A grasp by ordinary faculties. Let me say to you class that is, that is the depth of God's divine grace. And the anointing of his spirit that will allow us to grasp the spirit of wisdom. My friends, let me tell you something. That closer acquaintance with the Lord in the knowledge of him. Closer acquaintance with the Lord in the knowledge of him. Our Lord is the very book of eternal life. And maybe this is the greatest thing I will say for the entire evening. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the very book of eternal life that we must study and read on a daily basis. If we want to know about him, we got to read his book. And studying the life of Jesus Christ, oh, that is indeed the very book of eternal life. And my friends, amid the vague and new elements amid the vague and the new elements that are crowding us every day we need to be closer to christ isn't it yes we need to be closer to him so that we may know him as the good writer said oh that we might know him i like the way the author puts it thou my everlasting portion more than friend or life to me. All along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with thee. Not for ease our worldly pleasures, not for fame my prayers shall be. Gladly will I toil and suffer. Only let me walk with thee. The songster continued close to thee close to thee all along this tedious journey savior let me walk with thee lead me through the veil of shadows bear me over life's fitful sea then the gate of life eternal may i enter lord with thee close to thee close to thee Saints of God, the kingdom of God grows in vastness the more it is contemplated and sought. May I repeat this so that you can grasp the synergy of what I've just said. I said, saints of God, the kingdom of God grows in vastness the more it is contemplated and sought. The more it is contemplated and sought, is the greater the kingdom of God grows in its vastness in our inner man. My friends, the divine resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ will consume us. The divine resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ will consume us. The same power which raised Christ from the dead and set him at his father's right hand. It is, he is working in the believer's lives even today. The same power is working in the believer's lives even today. Evoking spiritual life in us and sustaining us from grace to grace and from glory to glory. And class, the two mysteries which exist in the development of Christ in his mystic body, I repeat, class, the two mysteries which exist in the development of Christ in his mystic body also exist 
in our ransomed souls. Exist in the ransomed souls of the believers. And live within our presence. The Holy Spirit. And the union with Christ. All combined together. The Holy Spirit. And the union with Christ. Yes, binds us together. My friends, you will conceive of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your human nature when we stick close to God. I repeat, we will conceive of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our human nature when we stick close to God. The Word of God points to this as a characteristic glory of the Christian life. I repeat, the Word of God points to this as the characteristic glory of the Christian life. The spirit who dwelled in Christ. The spirit who dwelled in Christ throughout his human life. In his fullness also extends his presence to all who are in union with Christ. We are incarnated by the Holy Spirit. He has tabernacled himself in us. And become a part of us. Are we become a part of him. My friend. Each soul. In grace with God. Is a partaker of the divine nature. Of the almighty God. I've said it, Have I said too much here. May I repeat what I've just said. I said the, the word of God. Points to this. As a characteristic glory. Of the Christian life. The spirit who dwelled in Jesus throughout his human life, the spirit who dwell with him in his fullness also extends his presence to all who are in union with Christ today. We are incarnated by the Holy Spirit. He has tabernacled himself in us, my friend. He is soul in grace with God. He's a partaker of the divine nature of the almighty God. Who oh, have I said too much here? May I repeat it for emphasis? I said each soul in grace with God is a partaker of the divine nature of the almighty God. Uh, he is sustained by the stream that flows from the throne of almighty God 24-7. There is in every child of God the dwelling of the comforter who dispels the darkness and amplifies the new and correct vision of the soul to the Almighty Father. My friends, the eyes, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our souls. Oh, what powerful statement this is. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our souls. Now, ah, he reveals to us the hope of his calling. The God of all grace shall call us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. According to the epistle of 1 Peter chapter 5, and the verse 10. The epistle of First Peter chapter 5. And the verse 10. But the God of all grace. The God of all grace. Who has called us into his eternal glory. By Christ Jesus. After you had suffered a while. He has made us perfected. And established us and strengthened us. And settled us in Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, to him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Saints of God, God exists. God exists. I repeat, saints of God, God exists and may be known. He exists and he may be known that he exists. And these two affirmations formed the foundation and inspiration of all Christian virtues, 
that God exists and he may be known. He exists and he may be known by those who want to know. Uh, well, I tell you, the first affirmation of faith and the second is experience. He may be known by faith. Only by faith we can know him. And then the mighty affirmation is the experience of that faith that we have in him. And my friends, and since, listen to me, and since the existence of God is not subject to scientific proof, I repeat, the existence of God is not subject to scientific proof or any form of human debate. The fact of the existence of God must be a postulate fact. Such existence must be assumed as a fact without doubt or without argument. God exists. And since he exists, he may be known. Amen. Since God transcends all his creation, he can be known only in his self-revelation. I repeat this. I said, since the existence of God is not subject to scientific proof, for no scientist can prove that God exists. I repeat, since the existence of God is not subject to scientific proof or debate, the fact of the existence of God must be a postulate fact. Such existence must be assumed as a fact without debate or without any form of argument. Did you hear me? And since God transcends all his creation, he can be known only in his self-revelation. Did you hear me, class? I said, since God transcends all his creation, he can only be known in his self-revelation. He will have to reveal himself for us to know him. Because we cannot search and find him out. We, he can only be known through his self-revelation. And listen to me, class. And this is why the Christian religion is so distinctive in that it is the only religion that claims that God can be known as a personal God only by his self-revelation according to his scriptures. Nobody can study to find him out. He must reveal himself to those whom he will. My friend, for instance, for instance, the Bible was written not to prove that God exists. Listen to me. The Bible was written not to prove that God exists. But the Bible was written to prove his existence. Amen. To reveal that he exists. And for that reason, the biblical revelation of God is in its nature progressive. And has only reached its fullness in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. Who is the distinct personality of God the Holy Father? I feel compelled in my spirit to repeat what I've just said. Because I'm not in a rush. I said earlier on, and I would like you to grasp it. Very firmly. I said, since the existence of God is not subject to scientific proof or academic debate. The fact of the existence of God must be a postulate fact. Such existence must assume as a fact without debate or without any academic argument. And since God transcends all his creation, he can be known only in his self-revelation. 
And this is why the Christian religion is so distinctive in that it is the only religion that claims that God can be known as a personal God only by his self-revelation according to the scriptures. May we then delve a little bit. For instance, the Bible was written not to prove that God exists. I repeat, the Bible was written not to prove that God exists. But the Bible was written to reveal him in his activities, to reveal that he exists, not to prove, but to reveal that he exists. Did you get that? And for that reason, the biblical revelation of God is in its nature progressive and has only reached its fullness in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, who is the distinct personality of God, the Holy Father. Did you get that? And listen to me, class, in light of his self-revelation, in light of God's self-revelation in the scriptures, there are several affirmations that can be safely made concerning God, the creator. In his being as God, he is self-existing. And his entire creation is dependent on him. I repeat, in his being as God, he is self-existing and his entire creation is dependent on him while he is utterly independent of all his creation. His entire creation dependent on him and he is independent of all his creation. God the Almighty not only has life, but he is life. God the Almighty not only has life, but he's life. Hallelujah. Uh, to the entire universe. He's life to the entire universe. And he has the source of such life within himself. He's life to the entire universe. And he has a source of such life within himself. And my friends, such biblical history and mystery such biblical history and mystery of God the Almighty was revealed to Moses when he was in the wilderness of Horeb where he as a human met with God while God was in the fire of burning bush according to Exodus chapter 3 Moses met with God when God was in the fire of burning bush. According to Exodus chapter 3. And the distinctive thing about that phenomenon was that the fire was burning. Yet the plants, the plants, our bush was not consumed. And to Moses and the rest of us, this phenomenon must have meant that the fire was very much independent of its environment or its surrounding. Did you understand what I said? I said this reveals that something serious was going on. The distinctive thing about that phenomenon with Moses was that the fire was burning, yet the plants or the bush was not consumed. And to Moses and to my class this evening, the rest of us, this phenomenon must have meant that the fire was very much independent of its environment or its surrounding. Something strange was going on. And indeed, such is the Almighty God, the Sovereign One, in His essential being. He is utterly and entirely independent of every environment in which he wills to make himself known. Did you hear me? Like when he was, ha, when he was writing on the king's wall, that king was having a banquet 
and brought the vessels from the temple into his banquet hall. Uh, and God Almighty came without an invitation. I have no doubt the rest of guests were invited. But God needs no invitation to go anywhere. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everywhere belong to him. Even if you don't invite him, he can show up any time. The king never invited him. But he showed up into the banquet hall. And he wrote on the wall of the king. Nobody saw him. Nobody saw him, but they saw his writing. Uh, that's the God we serve. And my friend, this unique quality of God's being, quite probably finds expression in his personal name, Yahweh. I repeat, this unique quality of God's being quite probably finds expression in his personal name, Yahweh. God, God in the Hebrew, Yahweh. And in his self-affirmation is I am who I am. I am who I am. That is, I am the one who was being without himself. I am the one who has life within myself. I repeat that. I said that this unique quality of God's being quite probably finds expression in his personal name, Yahweh, which is God in the Hebrew language. And in his self-affirmation is, I am who I am. Yahweh, I am who I am. Ah, that is, I am the one who has being without anyone can understand. I have being within. I have life within myself. I am the one who has life within my own self. Nobody gives it to me. According to Exodus chapter 3 and the verse 14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And that's what you must say to the children of Israel. When you go to take them out of Egypt, tell them that I am has sent me unto you. Ah, Moses asked God, who should I say send me? Tell them I am who I am. Hallelujah. This means that he is the one and only one who has life within himself. Nobody gives him life. And this same perception was implied in Isaiah's vision of God. The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He does not faint, nor does he grow weary. He gives power to those who faint. And to him who has no, who has no might, he increase their strength. According to Isaiah chapter 40. And class, listen to me. The almighty God is the giver. And he is a, cre he is a creator. He is a giver of life. And he is a creator of life. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave this mystery. Its clearest expression when he said to his audience. For as the father has life in himself. Even so he has granted the son also. To have life in himself. Read it for yourself in St. John chapter 5. And the verse 26. For as the father has life in himself. Even so he has granted the son. Also to have life in himself. Class. This makes the independence of life. A very distinctive quality of our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only our Lord Jesus Christ, but the entire Trinity. I said this makes the independence of life. A very distinctive quality of the entire Trinity. And in fact, throughout the sacred pages. God is revealed as a fountainhead. Of all that there is living. 
God is the fountainhead of all that there is living. Did you hear me? Animate and inanimate. Animate creatures and inanimate creatures. They are all lacking the qualities of life unless God gives it to them. Uh, our God is the creator uh, and life giver who has life in himself. Did you hear me? Our God is the creator and life giver who has life in himself. In God's nature, he is a pure spirit. Can I, can I take you out in, in the deep a little bit? Let us look at the nature of God. And I repeat, in God's nature is pure spirit. So don't you forget I tell you that. In God's nature, he is pure spirit. And this knowledge was grasped by human being very early in his self-disclosure as the author and the creator of the universe. He, the almighty God, is represented as the spirit who brought light out of darkness. The spirit who brought light out of darkness. He, the spirit who brought order out of chaos. God, the spirit brought light out of darkness. Did you hear what I'm telling you? And he brought order out of chaos. Read it for yourselves in Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And class, our Lord Jesus made this disclosure of God his Father as the object of worship to the woman of Samaria whom he met at Jacob's well when he walks among men. He told the woman he met at Jacob's well that God is spirit. Now look. Not God is a spirit, but God is spirit. God is spirit. And those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Read it for yourself in John chapter 4. Amen. And throughout the New Testament scriptures, apart from these two affirmations, there are frequent references concerning the nature of God as pure spirit. Now listen attentively because we are waddling out in the deep. I said throughout the New Testament scriptures, apart from the scripture I quoted to you, these affirmations, there are frequent references concerning the nature of God as a pure spirit. Pure divine spirit. God is pure divine spirit. In fact, he's called the father of spirits. Uh, by the writer of Hebrew chapter 12 and verse 9. God is called the father of spirits. By the writer of Hebrew chapter 12 and the verse 9. My friends, the writer says, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who correct us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits? Huh? The father of spirits and life? Look at verse 10. For our earthly fathers chastise us after their own pleasure. But our heavenly father chastises us for our own good so that we may be partakers of his holiness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Class, when we say that God is pure spirit, what am I saying to you? When I tell you that God is pure spirit and the Bible said that God is pure spirit, we are only emphasizing that God is not part spirit and part flesh. Now, you are really being dragged in the deep. I am, I am emphasizing to you that God is not, when I say God is pure spirit, he is entirely spirit. That's what I mean. 
we are emphasizing that God is not part spirit and part flesh as we are. God is all spirit without form, our physical parts. Oh, am I saying too much to you, class? Therefore, God has no physical presence. Mm. I, I'm, this is deep waters, I had warned you. God has no physical presence. And so, when the Bible speaks of God as having eyes and ears, hands and feet, listen to me, such is an attempt to convey to the human, to the human senses, these physical parts. Amen. So as for you to understand who God is, I repeat, when we say that God is pure spirit, we are only emphasizing that God is not part spirit and part flesh as we are. God is all spirit without forms of physical parts. Therefore, God has no physical presence. And so when the Bible speaks of God as having eyes and ears and hands and feet, such is an attempt to convey to human, the human senses, that these physical parts do exist. May I say to you, in, in theory, or in theology, such is called anthropomorphic expression. In theology, such is called anthropomorphic expression. Speaking of what is not human or earthly. Speaking of heavenly things in earthly language. When we speak of God's hands and God's feet and God's eyes and God's ears. We are speaking heavenly language in human terms. But God is pure spirit. He has neither hands nor feet nor ears nor eyes like you and me. Did you hear me? If we do not speak of God in physical terms, then human would not understand us when we speak of God. The human being is limited to time and space, but not so with God. Spirit has not any limit to time nor space. Uh, are you following me closely? Uh, spirit is not restricted in any form of existence. You cannot lock out spirit out of your house. So closing the door do not prevent spirit from coming in. <laughs> spirit is not restricted in any form of existence. When we say that God is infinite, is, is an infinite being, we are speaking entirely out of the reach of our personal experience with God. Do you hear me? As a human is limited to time. And the human is limited to space. And the human, human is limited to place. We are limited as to knowledge. And we are limited as to ability and power. But God is essentially unlimited to knowledge. And every element of his nature is unlimited, unlimited to sight, unlimited to hearing, unlimited to speaking. You cannot, you just cannot shut him out. I remember I told you early on, the king, the doors were shut, but God appeared in the banquet hall. And he began to write on the wall. And nobody saw him, but he wanted his hands to be seen. So he revealed his hand to the king and to the rest of his guests and, his, and his, his officials. All they saw was his hand because he wanted his hand to be seen, but they did not see his body because he is God. My friends, as a human is limited to time and space or place, we are limited as to knowledge and ability and power also. I repeat, as the human is limited to time and space and places, we are also limited as to knowledge and ability and power. 
But God is essentially unlimited. And every element of God's nature is unlimited. Unlimited sight. Unlimited power. Unlimited speech. God is unlimited. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Ah, well, his ulti, his, his unlimitedness to time, we call it eternity. God's unlimitedness to time, we the human call it eternity. Do you understand? His unlimitedness to space, we call it omnipresence. Because he can be everywhere at the same time. He can be everywhere at the same time. Oh yes. Not so with Satan. Satan has limitation. The devil cannot be everywhere at the same time. Do you understand me? Uh, I said as to space. Where God is concerned. We call it omnipresence. You cannot lock him out. He's everywhere at the same time. He can be everywhere at the same time. He is God. Not so with Satan. The devil. He cannot be everywhere at the same time. He's a limited fellow. Yeah. As to the knowledge. As to knowledge. We speak of God's knowledge as uh, omniscience. Omniscience. And as to his power. We speak of his omnipotence. He is all powerful. The eternity of God is something that human cannot grasp. My friends, when we think of the eternity of God, our hearts respond with immense gladness over that which our reason can never fully grasp. No human being can grasp the eternity of God. We humans will never be able to grasp the eternity of God. The almightiness of God. Oh, the ancient of days. Mm, who is from everlasting past. Eh, from everlasting, amen, to come. He, the everlasting one, whose years shall have no ending. Whose going forth is from the foundation of the world. Unto this very time and shall ever be. Uh, my friends. Jesus Christ the everlasting son. Who before the foundation of the world. Did live in co-equal glory with the father. Amen. And the Holy Spirit. Who existed co-equally with the father. From the beginning of time. God the father eternally. God the Son eternally. God the Holy Spirit eternally. Oh class. The concept of everlastingness. I said the concept of everlastingness. Run like the powerful aorta. That main artery of the body. That blood vessel that carries blood from the heart. The main channel of distribution of blood to the body. Uh, even so, the concept of God. The concept of God range throughout the entire Bible. Like the aorta that carries blood to the entire body. The concept of God reigns, amen, throughout the entire Bible. It looms very large in the orthodox Hebrew Christian concept. Everywhere you turn in the scripture, there's God. He's like, everywhere you cut the human body, there's blood. That mighty heart, that powerful bloodstream, amen, supplies the body with blood. Everywhere, so throughout the Bible. Ah, the concept of God is seen from Genesis to Revelation. Because the word everlasting is a word that is used by the sacred writers to mean long and lasting. Which to me is a great error for God is more than long and lasting. He is long and everlasting. 
Hallelujah. We don't speak of God as long and lasting. We speak of him as ever long and everlasting. Oh, glory to God. Uh, everlasting. My friend, the fact is, if the Bible had not taught that God is the endless being in the ultimate meaning of the term eternity, we would be forced to infer. We would be forced to infer it from his other attributes that is absolutely everlasting. Our God is absolutely everlasting. Ah, from everlasting to everlasting is God, said Moses the patriarch. God is from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, time, my friends, marks the beginning of all created things. Listen to me. I said time marks the beginning of all created things. But because God was never created, he never begun to exist. And such word beginning has no application to God. For he has no beginning. Such word ending has no application to God. Because he will never end. The word begin or begun is a word of time. And therefore can have no personal meaning for the high and lofty one. Who inhabited eternity. No age can heap. It's ugly gray hairs up on God. No age can cause any warp. Because his pure spirit cannot be warped. No age can cause gray hair for his pure spirit. There's no gray hair. No age can heap its ugly years on him. He is himself his own eternity. Without beginning or without ending. Hallelujah. He ever lives in the everlasting now. He ever lives in the everlasting now. He has no past and he has no future. Hallelujah. All he has is present. Glory to God. God has no past and he has no future. And so when time and words occur in the scriptures, such is only referring to humans and not God. When the four living creatures before the throne, the throne of God cried day and night, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Uh, in those profound utterances, those heavenly beings were only identifying God the everlasting one with the flow of created things with its uh, familiar three tents uh, holy, holy, holy Father, Son and Holy Ghost Lord God Almighty oh glory to God oh may God uh, God my friends uh, he dwells in eternity and may he reveal that to you if it is his will I said God dwells in eternity while time dwells in God. God dwells in eternity. <sighs> While time dwells in God. He has already lived all over yesterday. And all of tomorrow. This is just why God can say I am who I am. Amen. He has no beginning nor no ending. He is full spirit. Do you hear me? When you speak of God's hands and God's eyes, he's to make it, we are, we are sort of communicating with human being. Allowing human being to know that God sees us and God touches us. When we speak of God's feet, we are just allowing human being to know that he can be anywhere he wants to be. My friends, let me pull you in a little bit that the time in which we live He's very evil. Did you hear me? The time in which we live is very evil. Our time is running very late. Our evening sun is setting. 
the evening sun of this end time generation is setting over the horizon and the glory of God has departed from his church just as the fire fiery cloud once departed from the door of the temple right in the glaring sight of Ezekiel the prophet Ezekiel the prophet of God while stand at the altar offering sacrifice to God God's glory departed from the temple and it was left in darkness my friends the God of Abraham and the patriarchs of old God will know exactly about the almighty God the God of Abraham and the patriarchs of old God has withdrawn himself from the presence of the priests in the temple. And other gods whom our fathers knew not is taking position among God's people today. God has withdrawn himself from his temple today and the church is left without the presence of Almighty God. Yeah. And there are other gods whom our fathers knew not anything about is taking place and position in God's house. This is the God that we have made with our own hands. And because we have made him, we can please him with our corrupt lives. He is the God whom we have created. And so he cannot surprise us. The God that this end time world is serving cannot surprise us. For we are the one who made those gods. He cannot overwhelm us because he's made by human hands. Yeah. He just cannot astonish us because he's not the almighty God. Neither can he transcend us. In fact, we have made him. Therefore, we are his supreme we have made him, and so we are his supreme class of all that can be conceived of God the Almighty. His infinitude is the most difficult to be grasped. May I repeat this for emphasis, class? I said, of all that can be conceived of God, his infinitude is the most difficult to be grasped by human knowledge. Even to try to conceive the infinitude of God is somewhat very difficult to grasp. Infinitude, of course, means limitlessness. Can we grasp the limitlessness of God? And so then, it is obviously impossible for a limited mind as ours to grasp the unlimitedness of the unlimited God. Yeah. Oh, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Ah, as I have already said that uh, the main reason for our human dilemma is that we are trying to envision uh, we are trying to see God. Uh, the main reason for our human dilemma is that we are trying hard to envision our, uh, the very mood, our being of God. We want to see him and we are endeavoring to see him who we cannot see. Unless he reveals himself to us. And he can only reveal a modicum of his being, even that will strike us dead. When Moses drawing near to the burning bush, and when God saw that as a human he was coming too near, he said, stop Moses, don't come any closer. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. Ah, Moses was afraid, so he closed his eyes, just in case he would have seen God and die. 
Ah, people of God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of Almighty God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Ah, as I have already said that the main reason for our human dilemma is that we are trying to envision a mood of being that is altogether foreign to us. Who can, who can make God we have never seen? How can you make somebody you have never seen? Think about it. <laughs> How can you paint somebody or something you have never seen? Huh. Well, think about it. The very moment we human begin to contemplate God and the utterance of his majesty, all our human eloquence is immediately frozen for his mightiness cannot be grasped by the human wisdom. His greatness just cannot be conceived. And should we conceive his greatness, then he would be less than our human mind, which could, from, which could form a conception of him. He, the Almighty, is greater than all the human language. And so there is no human statement that can truly express who God really is. There's no, no human artist that can paint who God really is. You cannot conceive, I told you in my introduction, he is pure spirit. Didn't I tell you that? Who can draw spirit? Who can make a painting of spirit? Think about what I've just said. If there is any human statement that could express who God is, he's then, he would be less than the human speech and he would be less than the human vocabulary which could comprehend and gather up all that they think about him. Class, let me tell you this one single thing. Unfortunately, the word infinite has not always been held in its precise meaning by the human vocabulary. I repeat, class, I said, unfortunately, the word infinite has not always been held to its precise meaning. But most time has been used very carelessly to be in a simple much a great deal as a teacher who takes infinite pains with his class. Huh? Who can take infinite pain to assume who God is? When we speak of God's infinitude, we mean that he knows no bounds. God knows no bounds. Ah, he is without limit. You cannot shut him out. You cannot fence him out. Did not I tell you that King Belsedra tried to do that? But he appeared in the banquet hall. He is without limit, the almighty God whom we serve. Again, to say that God is infinite is to say that he is measureless. Did you hear me, class? To say that God is infinite is to say that God is measureless. For measurement is the way we account for created things. So since God is measureless, then we cannot account for anything about him. Did you hear me? Measurement describes limitations. Measurement describes imperfections. And therefore, just cannot be applied to God, the perfect one. Did you hear me? The mercy of God is infinite to all. He's infinite class. And therefore, 
the person who has felt the grinding pain of inward guilt knows that this statement is more than simple academic. I repeat, I said, the mercy of God is infinite. The mercy of God is infinite. Just as God is infinite. Have I said too much here? I doubt it. The mercy of God Almighty is infinite. And therefore, the person who has felt the grinding pain of inward guilt of sin knows this statement is more than simple academic. Because we have been forgiven of that burden of sin with which we have carried I've lived for many years. And class, abounding sin is a terror of the human world. Abounding sin is a terror of the human world. But oh, abounding grace is the only hope of the humankind. However abounding human sin might be, abounding grace is greater. Oh, bless be God Almighty. God's abounding grace is more than human abounding sin. However sin may abound, it still has a limit. Yes, for sin is a product of finite minds. Sin is a product of finite bodies. Hey, but God's grace, amen, in abundance above and beyond our human calamities. Oh, glory to God. It doesn't matter what calamity we find ourselves in. The grace of God uh, will take care. Uh, the Christian witness, my friend, the Christian witness over the centuries was and still remain the same that God so loved the world. I said the Christian witness over the centuries was and still remain the same. What is it? That God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth and believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Therefore, my friends, it remains for us to see that love in the light of God's inf infinite grace. In the light of God's measureless love and boundless compassion. Uh, his love has no bounds. Because his love is not a thing. But his love is a facet of the essential nature of God the Almighty. Oh my goodness gracious me. Did you hear what I have said? I said the Christian weakness over the years, over the centuries was and still remains the same that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into, into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. My friends, therefore, it remains for us to see that love in the light of God's infinite, measureless compassion. Such love of God is boundless. His love has no bounds. Did you hear me? His love is boundless. His love has no bounds because his love is not a thing. But God's love is a facet of his essential nature. God's love is a facet or a part of his essential nature of God the Almighty. His love is who he is. And because he is infinite, his love is also infinite. His love has no beginning. And his love has no ending. Oh, hallelujah to God. God is almighty and his love is also almighty. My goodness me. His love is a facet 
of the essential nature of God the Almighty One. His love is who he is. Mm -hmm. And because he is infinite, his love is also infinite. Hallelujah. We see love in light of his infinitude. His love is measureless and his love is boundless. His love is limitless. Yeah. Saints of God, this is the God who, who we adore. This is the God who we serve. This is the God whom we worship. Our faithful, unchangeable friend. Our faithful and unchangeable Savior. Whose love is as great as his power. Whose love knows no measure. Whose love has no ending. Oh, the love of God is greater far than pen can write or tongue can tell. Oh, please bless me, God. Yes, tis Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment, and his blood has made me whole. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and the verse 10. The God of all grace Oh, what a note to pull the curtains down on. Ah, yes. Think about it. Mm, I love it. Jesus is my savior. This is the God we worship. Ah, and this is a God we adore. Ah, whose love is as great as his power. And who love who knows no end. Yes. It is Jesus. Did you hear me? You have suffered for our sins. Did you hear me? Oh. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace. The God of all grace shall himself perfect. Listen when we close. I like it. I, I, I sort of like it. Go back. Let me go back to it, O oh, saints of God. This is a God we adore. This is a God we serve. This is a God we worship, our faithful, unchangeable friend, our faithful, unchangeable Savior, whose love is as great as his power, and neither knows measure nor end. Oh, yes, it is Jesus in my soul, for I have touched the hem of his garment, and his blood has made me old. You'll want to look at 1 Peter 5 and the verse 10. Uh, the God of all grace. Who has called us into his eternal glory. The God of all grace. But the God of all grace who has called us into his eternal glory. By Jesus Christ. After that you have suffered a while. He will make you perfect. Though you suffer a while. He's going to make you perfect. Then he's going to establish you. And strengthen you. And then settle you in his grace. Oh hallelujah. Think about it my friends. Mm, look at verse 11. To him be glory. And dominion. Forever and ever. The God of all grace. Shall himself perfect, establish, and strengthen you. The God of all grace shall himself, my, such is, such is grace for all occasions. The God of all grace means grace for all occasions, for all and for all persons. Uh, this all grace may be best defined as unmerited Grace. Ah, I think I could say that. Yes. The God of all grace shall be best defined as unmerited grace. Perpetual grace. Marvelous grace. That is the eternal, in the eternal position of the giver. 
this all grace may be best defined as unmerited grace. Grace that we do not merit. Perpetual grace that is always available. Marvelous grace that is in the eternal position of God, the everlasting Father who gives grace. My friends, the God of all grace will do for us much more than what we can expect or ask of him. The God of all grace, what is being said here? Such grace of his love, such grace of his compassion, such grace of his mercy will constantly compassing, will constantly being showered on us, will constantly encircle us and sustain our hearts. The God of all grace will do it for us again and again. Oh, class, what perfect blaze of demand this is. The God of all grace. God of all grace. Eternal glory. Almighty power. He will make it happen. And if these are not enough, we also find the perfection thrown in it as a brother. Hallelujah. He'll make us perfect. The saints, what God has joined together, then let no man put asunder. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this combination of blessings. Ah, God of all grace will do for us much more than what we can expect or ask of him. Such grace, his love, his compassion, his mercy. Ah, his love, his grace, his compassion, hey, his forgiveness, hey, his strength and his power, sustaining grace. Oh, hallelujah. The God of all grace will do it for us again and again. Class, what perfect blaze of demands. God of all grace. God of eternal grace. God of glory. God of compassion. God of power. Hallelujah, God of healing, ah, God of grace. And as if these are not enough, what I've just said, we also find the God of perfection thrown in it. He's a God of perfection. As if these are not enough. Ah, saints, what God has joined together, what has he joined together? Love, compassion, perfection, and grace. Don't let us separate them. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. And saints, what God has joined together, no one should separate. The God of all grace, who called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. God called us, you and me, to his eternal glory. I want to shout, but it's not shouting time. He's going to perfect us. Then establish us. Then strengthen us. Then settle us in his eternal kingdom. Hallelujah to God Almighty. You don't hear me? Saints, what a God, what a mighty God we serve. Saints, what God has joined together. Don't separate it. The God of all grace. Who has called us into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ. He's going to perfect us. Then he's going to establish us. Then he's going to strengthen us. Then he's going to settle us in his eternal kingdom. People of God, what an assurance of hope this is. Everything is done. Everything is settled. Oh, dear saints of God, pull down the shutters with me. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship should set his love upon the human race. Why a shepherd he should seek the wanderers to bring them back within the fold. I know not why or how. Saints of God, the God of all grace, grace in the human vocabulary involves such thing as respect and adoration. Oh, people of God, May it be pleasing to the Almighty God 
to grant us his favor this evening.